Welcome to the Cocky Ride Home for Tuesday, October 20th, 2020. I'm Jackson Bird. Tardigrade sunscreen coming soon. How to enjoy a socially distanced holiday season. Some promising methods for upcycling plastic into more valuable materials. And the curious case of the extremely moldy Twinkie. Here are some of the cool things from the news today. Tardigrades, you know, the adorable microscopic water bears that can survive basically anything, like being frozen for 30 years and then being revived again, or as a species, surviving all five mass extinctions. Well, a newly discovered strain of tardigrade has another superpower, protection from lethal levels of ultraviolet light. A recent study published in the Royal Society Journal found that the Paramacrobiotis BLR strain of tardigrade, first detected in Bangalore, exhibits a fluorescent shield to protect against UV light, causing them to glow. Quoting CNN, For the experiment, Sandeep M. Eswarapa, assistant professor at the Indian Institute of Science, exposed this tardigrade along with another type of tardigrade, Hypsibius exemplaris, to UV light. All of the paramacrobiotis tardigrades survived for 30 days after 15 minutes of exposure to the lethal rays. The other tardigrade died within 24 hours of exposure. The hardy tardigrade was also the only specimen observed in the experiment to have glowed under the harsh light, which the researchers revealed was the key to their survival. The research team proposed that the tardigrade has a fluorescent shield that absorbs the harmful light and emits a harmless blue light, which is what causes them to glow. After discovering that their ability to glow was the tardigrade's secret weapon, Eswarapa made a fluorescent extract from the Paramacrobiotis BLR strain and covered the other type of tardigrade used in the experiment in the protective material. When exposed to UV light, this enhanced tardigrade, which had originally died from exposure to the radiation after a day, showed partial tolerance. End quote. The UV light used in the experiment is stronger than the UV light that reaches us on Earth from the sun, but after conducting more experiments on tardigrades, Eswarapa hopes to expand his research and says it's possible an extract of the fluorescent shield from the tardigrade could be used as a sunscreen for humans. Tardigrade sunscreen. Coming soon to goop, probably. Yesterday, I talked about the risks of traveling home for the holidays via plane. Today, I want to share some tips for making the holidays enjoyable if you'll be celebrating them while socially distanced from your loved ones. And I'm mostly pulling here from an article by one of my personal favorite writers, S. Bear Bergman in Vice, who had a great spin on this. He said for most Jewish people, the whole how to celebrate the holidays during a pandemic thing has already finished. Their biggest holidays are done, but for anyone who will be celebrating Thanksgiving here in the U.S. or using the most common time off in December to spend extra time virtually with loved ones, here are some lessons Bergman learned from his holiday experiences during the pandemic thus far. His first tip sounds simple, but it's one that I feel pretty strongly about. Actually do something. Even if you're all alone or just not feeling it this year, which anyone could understand, if you find some way to celebrate the holiday of your choice and lean into whatever traditions you can still do or do in an amended way, you'll feel all the better for it. This is why most holidays began in the first place. Times were tough. Like, real dark, you know, people needed feast days and celebrations to look forward to, to break up the monotony, to have a last hurrah before the days got shorter, to come together and consider something larger than themselves. Quoting Bergman in Vice, There's a very strong possibility that if you do the actions of celebration, the feelings will follow. Jewish tradition teaches that even if you're not in the mood, even if you're alone, even if you're afraid, you should do the traditional things anyway as best you can, and the feeling will come to you in the act. End quote. And the next tip, don't entirely write off a Zoom gathering. I know we are all sick of video calls, and to some of us, the idea of doing a video call instead of an actual gathering might actually sound more depressing. 
But Bergman says, despite his skepticism, doing Passover Seder via Zoom was actually really nice. It can open the opportunity to virtually gather with friends or relatives you may not usually include at your celebration due to geographic barriers. And beyond familial or social gatherings, if you're a religious person, virtual services are also an opportunity to explore a congregation or other religious gathering that may be more in line with your beliefs than the one you'd previously been going to, or ones that are available to you geographically. In my own experience, so far, even individual institutions that are being allowed to reopen and gather in person again are continuing to stream services in perpetuity. So you could join a community on the other side of the country without ever planning to attend in person. Now, as for food, one of the more important parts of holidays, Bergman has two tips. The first is virtual cooking classes with family members who usually make particular dishes. And a bonus here, you can record the call for future reference to get the recipe just right. I've had a few friends do this, and I'll just say, given the frustrations that can occur with video conferencing technology, maybe prepare yourself for it to be a bit more of a grumpy, bickering affair than an idyllic elders passing knowledge onto the next generation hallmark moment. That might go for most of these tips, really. The other way to break bread in our pandemic era, if you live within driving distance at least, is to do a drive-by potluck. Make your usual batch of several dozen tamales, package them up for several households, and then go drop them off for the others to enjoy. And if you're all gathering for Zoom later, you can even wait to eat the dishes until you're all on the call together. Or if you're not near the folks you'll be celebrating with, just drop portions of your dish off with people in your community who you know could use a good home-cooked meal right now. As many of us have probably learned from video calls by now, they need a bit more structure than an in-person gathering. Prepare for this by coming up with some discussion starters or planning an agenda. I mean, maybe even consider nominating a person or two to be the facilitator, as clinical as that sounds. And your mileage may vary here, but Bergman suggests actually getting dressed like you would for an in-person gathering, because it will break up the monotony of your pandemic sweatpants and make you feel like you're actually doing something different and not logging on for your fourth Zoom social hour of the week. And finally, with all the time that you're saving by not traveling or hosting people or cooking or cleaning as much, plan out what you'll do with that time you saved. Whether it's taking a walk, doing an activity with your household, or calling other friends or loved ones, just make sure to actually use the time in a more laid-back, recreational way like you would that spare time on any other relaxing holiday. Holidays are weird now, but we don't have to sacrifice them altogether. And if you want a few more specific tips, check out the link in the show notes. Even if you're a pro, it can be tough to map out the perfect workout plan for your body that challenges you and lets you recover when you need it. FitBod is a smart fitness app that takes all the guesswork out of planning your workouts. With each workout, the app learns your abilities and plans workouts designed to maximize your results. And by cycling new exercises into the mix, FitBod keeps your workouts fun and fresh. I love how it notifies me when my muscles have recovered from my last workout and how, until then, it suggests exercises that will focus on other parts of my body. It's just refreshing to have an app that's just as focused on recovery as it is on motivation. And with FitBod, you can get a program tailored to your unique body, experience, and environment. It's super easy to use and even has HD video tutorials to make learning new exercises a breeze. Personalized training can be tough on the budget, but FitBod is only $9.99 a month or $59.99 a year. Plus, you can try one month of workouts absolutely free. Get a personalized fitness plan that helps you work out smarter at fitbod.me slash kotki. Try FitBod for free for one month when you sign up today at fitbod.me slash kotki. That's one free month when you sign up at fitbod.me me slash Kotki. I talked a while back about the many challenges surrounding recycling plastic and a lot of the sometimes intentionally engineered misconceptions about how to do so and what plastic can be recycled. Today, I want to share a couple of studies with some promising solutions, not for new recycling methods, but for upcycling plastic into more valuable materials. The first method uses iron-based catalysts to create carbon nanotubes. I'm quoting Ars Technica, 
Normally to break down plastics, catalysts and plastics are heated together. But in this case, the researchers simply mixed the catalyst and ground up plastics and heated the iron using microwaves. Like water, iron absorbs microwave radiation and converts it into heat. This causes the heat to be focused on the site where catalytic activities take place, rather than being evenly spread throughout the reaction. The difference is striking. Compared to traditional heating, the microwave heating released over 10 times as much hydrogen from the plastic, leaving very little other than pure carbon and some iron carbide behind. Better yet, the carbon was almost entirely in the form of carbon nanotubes, a product with significant value. And it all happened extremely quickly, with hydrogen being released less than a minute after the microwaves were applied. The process was completed in less than two minutes. End quote. The process was also replicable, with more ground-up plastic being added in up to ten times. As for the second method being conducted by another group, they are trying to find a solution that would create clearly defined products instead of the mix of chemicals that many methods usually produce. Quoting again, Enzymes digest polymers all the time, and in many cases they produce clearly defined products by chewing the polymer from one end, releasing one subunit of the polymer at a time. Typically, this works because the polymer fits into a slot on the surface of the enzyme that includes the catalytic site, and the enzyme moves along it, advancing as each reaction removes a piece of the polymer. It should be possible, the researchers reasoned, to make an artificial catalyst that works in similar ways. To do so, the researchers created a silicon oxide surface with lots of pores and then placed a platinum catalyst at the base of each pore. In the right solvent, long plastic polymers would have a higher affinity for the surface of the silicon oxide and thus attach themselves to the surface. From there, a number would inevitably enter the pore and end up running into the catalyst. Thus, the catalyst would get the chance to act on one end of the polymer only, rather than running into it at some random location in the middle of the chain. And the method largely worked when fed polyethylene. The catalyst wasn't as specific as an enzyme. Instead of lopping off a single part of the polyethylene chain, it tended to release a small chunk, about 14 carbons long, but it also liberated molecules containing anywhere from 8 to 30 carbons. 14 just happened to be the most frequent length. But by making the pores deeper, the researchers were able to shift this value to 16 and 18 carbons, allowing them to tune the population of molecules that come out of the reaction." End quote. Now the good news here is that the polyethylene can be turned into any type of hydrocarbon mixture, like fuel or lubricants, whatever is most valuable at the time. But the downside is that the platinum used as a catalyst is expensive, and so far it only works on one type of plastic. Meanwhile, the benefits of the previous method, the iron catalysts one, is that not only is iron relatively cheap, but also the study used plastics found at a supermarket to ensure that the process would work on commonly available plastics. Now, even though I only have a passing comprehension of these types of experiments, I'm always so energized to hear about them because it gives me hope that we have so many leads and so much work being done to ensure a more sustainable future. Ending today with a super gross story that honestly made me almost physically ill when I read it, but I was looking at the photos, which I am sparing you from. Unless you click on the link in the show notes, you monster. But this is your warning. If you are squeamish, you might not want to listen to this one. Basically, scientists have been studying three eight-year-old Twinkies that all molded in completely different ways. It all started earlier this month when photographer and scientist Colin Purrington remembered a box of Twinkies that he bought in 2012. Remember back when Hostess went bankrupt and there was a brief moment when we all thought the Twinkie would be gone forever? He dug the box out of his basement and was stunned to discover three very different types of Twinkies. One looked pretty much fine. Another had a large mold spot about the size of a quarter, and the third was completely shriveled, looking either like a weird kind of morel or almost as if it had been burned to ash but kept its relative shape. So much for Twinkies outlasting humanity. Officially, NPR notes, their shelf life is just 45 days, and it seems like maybe Purrington should have bore that in mind before diving in, because before noticing the moldy Twinkies, he did take a bite of the normal-looking one, and, well, it was not normal. 
It tasted, he said, like an old sock. Most Twinkies do continue to look alright on the outside for years, even decades on end. But as we now know from Purrington, they apparently don't taste so good for that long. But why did three Twinkies, in the same box, bought at the same time, and kept in the same place for eight years unopened, have such vastly different reactions? West Virginia University scientists Brian Lovett and Matt Casson wanted to know too. After Purrington posted his Twinkies on Twitter, it caught their attention, and they asked if he would send his Twinkies to their lab. Lovett and Casson study fungi, specifically how well mold grows on peeps, which it apparently doesn't do too well because of the low water content of peeps. And in other news, studying fungi on peeps is apparently a job that some people have. And I love it. The type of dried out reaction of the super weird Twinkie is similar to what Lovett and Casson have seen happen in insects attacked by fungi. So that was their first hypothesis. They also thought that the fungus probably got in before the package was sealed because of the way the Twinkie was sort of sucked inwards in its closed package. Using a bone marrow biopsy tool to drill through the outer layer, they were surprised to discover there was still some soft cream filling inside the now hardened exterior. While they were able to identify Cladosporium, the most common airborne indoor mold in the world, on the Twinkie with the small mold spot, they have thus far been unable to identify any spores on the, as they call it, mummified Twinkie. Lovett said, quote, It may be that we don't have any living spores despite this wonderful, rare event that we've witnessed. Spores certainly die, and depending on the fungus, they can die very quickly, end quote. Lovett and Casson are continuing to experiment, but for now, the mystery of why this one Twinkie would behave so drastically different than the others remains unsolved. The one thing I know for certain is that I am never, ever eating a Twinkie again. That is it from me for today. As always, this show was produced by Ride Home Media and Kotki.org. I am Jackson Bird, and I am going to go try to delete those photographs of the moldy Twinkie from my brain forever. I hope you have a good rest of your day, and I'll talk to you again tomorrow. 